Jonathan, maybe we'll start with you as you talked about this report uh, that the Fed just published. So why don't you kick us off? Yeah, happy to do it. So um, we published this paper which uh, looked at sort of sizing the industry um, for CDFIs and particularly around the growth of the industry. Um, so we are, were able to estimate in August of this year that the CDFI industry is over $450 billion in total assets, which is a substantial uh, amount of growth from uh, five years earlier. And so it was growth not just in terms of the um, asset size of the industry, but in terms of the number of certified CDFIs. So whereas five years ago there were around 1,100 CDFIs, now there are closer to 1,500 CDFIs. Um, and then by institution type, we were able to kind of figure out that um, within the CDFI space, the certified um, CDFIs, the loan funds are the largest um, in terms of number of institutions, followed by credit unions uh, and then banks and, and others. And, um, but what's interesting about that is of the $450 billion plus in assets, um, credit unions are actually the largest, credit unions that were certified as CDFIs. So those weren't necessarily uh, new organizations that had started within the last five years, but they were organizations that had been around but then sought the CDFI certification at some point. And so uh, it was just you know, for us to be able to publish this paper and, and really see the, the data around credit unions representing now $300 billion in total assets. You know, banks are somewhere in the $115 billion in assets range, and then loan funds, which are you know, predominantly nonprofits, uh, somewhere in the, in the $35 billion range. And to see sort of that growth over time was something we, um, you know, we were able to include in our paper. So. Yeah, and I think also something for CDFIs that I learned stepping into this session is these institutions range you know, at the top end of having portfolios in the billions to, on the lower end, tens of thousands. So while we're all you know, classifying them under the CDFI label, there's a huge disparity within this industry. Um, yeah, just to add to that, also not only in size do they vary, but the types of loans that they specialize in vary dramatically. Um, a lot of CDFIs focus more on affordable housing, some do small business loans, some do a, a spectrum of, of loans, um, charter schools, community development. Um, so there really is a lot of heterogeneity, heterogeneity in the market, um, which makes it an interesting story to tell investors. Um, and so kind of tagging on to what uh, Jonathan said as it relates to kind of the, the scope of the sector, from a capital market standpoint, the um, CDFIs, the larger ones, a lot of the larger, a few of the larger ones have accessed the capital markets directly. Um, and they've gotten ratings from S&P mostly. Um, so about 13 CDFIs currently have ratings, um, eight of which have actually accessed the capital markets. Um, those issuances have been uh, mostly geo or corporate unsecured financings. Um, kind of the median rating currently is, is A+. Plus. Um, there's been a little bit of, of volatility in the ratings because it is you know, somewhat of a new sector. They just started um, getting rated about six or seven years ago, and S&P being the only rating agency that really is dominant in the sector, there was a bit of criteria changes that caused some kind of um, changes within changing of ratings as it relates to criteria. And that's never a good way to build goodwill with investors in an emerging sector. Um, but it feels like that's behind us. Um, but still, um, we often talk to issuers about seeking two ratings to kind of give investors another voice um, as it relates to kind of um, credit quality in terms of it being an emerging sector. Some other pathways, as I mentioned, there's a variety of loan types, um, which also opens the door to a, a few other capital markets tools in addition to securitizations. Um, we've worked with CDFIs on kind of affordable housing project related um, issuances, um, which allowed them to access the tax exempt market. Um, so that's another creative tool for CDFIs that are looking to, that are affordable housing focused. Um, and then you have this, this um, securitization side of things. You have, um, we've seen some securitizations in kind of more established markets like the small business loan 7A guaranteed um, market as well as um, agency backed um, affordable housing loans. So Freddie, Freddie Mac backed securitization. So these are tools that you know, are used broadly and it's kind of a well established market. So CDFIs have been, some CDFIs have been able to take advantage of that. Um, so, you know, the topic here is, you know, securitizations and, and a way to scale CDFIs. Um, it feels like CDFIs have some momentum in terms of 
becoming a presence in the capital markets and building a name for themselves that kind of helps feed into um, building some momentum towards other types of securitizations that are kind of less standard um, because typically CDFI loans, since they are uh, mission-driven lenders, are targeted towards underserved communities and often are not standard, and that is something that's very difficult to securitize. Um, so I'll kind of stop there. And Jonathan, you want to add? Yeah, I mean, I guess I'd build off that, and we could have underscored that at the start, that you know, CDFIs are truly mission-driven lenders. They're chartered to focus on uh, a specific community that is otherwise not being well-served by the mainstream financial markets. And for that reason, they've long been a really attractive place for impact investors to work with. Um, and I should have said, you know, in my introduction, at the Alliance, we work with uh, a range of investors from foundations to corporations, from high net worth individuals to family offices, uh, from folks who are looking for you know, market rate and even above market rate returns through to folks who are willing to accept concession. And I think what you hear from both Jonathan and from Kristen is that CDFIs, for, for someone who is pursuing impact, provide just this range of options, range of entry points. Uh, whether you have grant capital to deploy or PRI capital as a private foundation or depository assets, whether your focus is affordable housing or uh, small business lending, um, there are a bunch of different opportunities for inv impact investors. And the ones who have been in this market for uh, you know, many, many years now, decades now, um, can tell you that you know, they have seen consistent performance from the CDFI industry uh, both in terms of you know me meeting the sort of financial commitments of the investment, but also meeting the impact objectives of the investor, um, and we've seen uh, this steady growth of interest from the impact investing community. I think in the early days it was maybe a few small or, or few large private foundations that really led the way, or some regional foundations like Winthrop Rockefeller that works in the southeast. Um, but especially after the events of 2020, the, the health and social and economic crises, we saw a, a, a really just surge in interest from impact investors in deploying assets through this, uh, you know, really vital pathway. And it's important, you know, looking at this market that these CDFIs play a key role in the ecosystem because for many businesses, if you're a small business and you're looking for a loan of, let's say, $75,000, CDFI is really your only option to get that loan. Because if you go to a traditional commercial bank for small business lending, generally they don't like to go below $250,000. So these CDFIs play a key role in providing that kind of first loan to a small business who potentially doesn't have the credit history or doesn't have the assets or needs you know, growth capital to get on that journey. So this is an absolutely essential piece of our ecosystem. Um, and growing it will only help more uh, small businesses. So yeah, I just want to come back to the point that John was making. I mean, you know, talking about the, the industry and, you know, one thing that we looked about or looked at in this report was just the equity and the amount of equity uh, that the institution types have, at, at, you know, as of the time we were able to publish it. So I mean, credit unions alone are, we estimated somewhere in the 30 billion range in, you know, call it net assets or net worth, but bank, credit union, loan fund, what have you. And so between credit unions at 30 billion, banks at maybe, you know, call it 15 approximately, 10 to 15, um, and loan funds maybe in the 5 to 10 range, I mean, that's, you know, close to 50 billion in capital that much of which, you know, in the way we think about it in terms of that growth, I mean, um, there are a lot of new sources of funds you know, to your point, John, that have come into the sector that represent a, you know, a significant portion of that, um, you know, that close to 50 billion, which I think that's, uh, you know, it's just something to, to highlight. Mm -hmm. So we're here in an impact investing conference, and we've heard about impact VC, outcomes-based financing, private credit in the impact space. Chris, I'm going to turn to you. Why, why should an impact investor consider this asset class to deploy their capital in? What makes it special? And you, know, you mentioned one of these things, institutional ESG versus impact ESG. I would love to hear your views, uh, you know, sharing with the audience. This. Sure. Um, so most of the work I do kind of operates more in the institutional 
space. So kind of more um, publicly offered transactions or bond issuances, which captures really strong demand in terms of ESG investors, institutional ESG investors. Now, we've seen increasing demand. We've seen um, a lot of funds close. We've seen a lot of funds open um, as it relates to ESG strategies. But I think at the end of the day, it's clear that there is ongoing demand and growth in the ESG sector, whether you're talking about on the corporate side or on the municipal tax exempt side of the market. So, um, you know, there are strong tailwinds in terms of, you know, the institutional demand. And all, as I mentioned before, there are eight CDFIs that have come to market with unsecured general obligation issuances, uh, or corporate issuances, and they've all had some label associated with them, whether it's green or sustainability. Most have been sustainability um, because they really do bring together both social as well as a lot of more real estate driven or affordable housing driven um, lenders have some kind of lead certification embedded in kind of their building standards. So that would kind of cover the green side of things. And so, you know, the market standard for the institutional side of things um, is the ICMA standards, um, which a lot of investors kind of have their own demands, as I don't have to tell you all in this room, especially in the impact space, there's a lot of diversity and lack of standardization often in terms of metrics and disclosure and things like that. Um, but at the end of the day, the ICMA standards are kind of what everyone lay, lay, hangs their hat on, on in the institutional space. So, you know, that's kind of one set of a pool of capital. And then we have, you know, the impact pool of capital, which I view as, you know, has more um, opportunity to be um, gained changing as it relates to being catalytic, um, taking kind of the first loss position in, in, um, in the capital stack, um, you know, uh, and having a variety of, of um, uh, more concessionary capital um, that can really get things moving, especially in a market like we're seeing now, obviously, the rapid rise in rates and the, um, you know, the kind of scarcity of subsidy for some of our, you know, most important objective, objectives as it relates to affordable housing, you know, banking the underbanked, building, um, you know, economically vibrant communities. Um, and there's some, there's often a lack of subsidy where it really matters. And so, whether it's you know foundations providing grants, technical assistant grant, technical assistance grants, or you know a variety of, of type of support, it really can help catapult a structure into something that would kind of dip into kind of the more scalable um, you know institutional side of the market eventually. I mean, I see this, and I see kind of the structures that are being bandied about um, as kind of stepping stones to potentially a, a broader, more, um, to tap into that institutional market. Often things start with kind of a, you know, a, a bank or loan facility of some kind that has some kind of concessionary capital or equity involved. And then, you know, as loans might get seasoned, then potentially there could be a public market takeout. And so, you know, the life cycle of these transactions early on often hinge on impact or catalytic capital um, to kind of get it off the ground, especially when you're talking about new structures in a very uh, dicey market, to say the least. Great. John or Jonathan? I was, no, I didn't have any comments. <laughs> Great. Well, looking to you, John, you know, the U.S. Impact Investing Alliance is really a market builder. Um, and from your perspective as, you know, market builder, how do you view this? How would you recommend to impact investors to look at community finance to broaden their investment portfolio? Yeah, it's a good question. And I mean, I think Kristen was touching on a lot of it here. You know, so much of what's needed, especially as we've had the growth in number and um, sort of scale of CDFIs over the last couple of years, um, there's a tremendous need to invest in the technical capacity the back office capacity of these uh, CDFIs to make sure that they are uh, sort of primed to scale. I think putting in that first loss capital or long-term patient capital, catalytic capital, is also always going to be uh, essential. You know, you think about the lending or the business model of CDFIs as a lender, anything you can do to drive down their cost of capital, you know, that's impact because they'll be able to do more with that. They'll be able to uh, uh, ser better serve the community where they're focused on. I think the other thing that we're especially focused on uh, at the uh, U.S. Impact Investing Alliance that we did want to touch on is the role of public policy. Mm -hmm. um, and that has been tremendously important to the CDFI industry from the beginning, really. It was in 1994 with the Rigel Act that 
the CDFI fund was established to begin certifying these institutions to legally define um, the phrase and to also begin putting federal capacity into these institutions. Um, and that has been essential and it's also been a bipartisan issue over the years um, through the Clinton, Bush, Obama, Trump, and now Biden administrations. Uh, the CDFI fund has remained um, a bipartisan issue. The Trump administration did propose zeroing out its budget, but that was roundly rejected by bipartisan majorities in Congress. And that's because you know every representative and senator has a CDFI in their district or in their state and knows the impact that they're having on the ground. And they want to continue to feed this industry, want to continue to build it up, want to continue to strengthen it. And so I think we've heard actually really encouragingly across this conference, and all credit to uh, 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 Valentin and his colleagues at the Sorensen uh, Impact Institute, uh, that there's been a lot of discussion about the role that impact investors can play in partnership with government. Uh, which hasn't always been sort of a natural partnership, um, but this is a really great example where, you know, if you can demonstrate uh, the positive impact on the ground, you can build these bipartisan alliances and then you can have government come in as a partner. So really essential for uh, impact investors to be telling this story as well. Of, look, this is why these are essential partners for us to be able to put our capital to work in the kinds of communities where we might not otherwise have the sort of opportunities we won't have the um, on the ground expertise and connections to the community to be able to make a $75,000 loan uh, directly ourselves, but we can work through these vital intermediaries uh, and do so. So I think that messaging and you know, bring your friends too, if you've got, uh, if you can get a co-investor, that's always great too. So again, telling the story. And I think this is something important to highlight that this is very much still a nascent asset class industry, whatever you want to call it. I mean, there's, you mentioned eight securitized, eight CDFIs have securitized um, part of their portfolios, and that's mainly probably at the upper end, right? What about all those that are doing, you know, with the tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands, you can't feasibly securitize and sell that kind of portfolio. What are some options for kind of those, that middle layer or those smaller CDFIs? Yeah, and that's a great question. Um, you know, and also just to piggyback on what you said uh, as it relates to kind of the federal involvement, um, we've seen a fair bit of federal dollars flowing towards CDFIs that are worth noting. Um, first, we have the State Small Business Credit Initiative that was as part of the um, American Recovery Act. Um, and it's about $10 billion flowing through states over eight years um, in support of small business lending, of which is targeted towards underserved communities. So as you can imagine, CDFIs are going to play a large role in this program. Um, those funds have already started to, to go out. Um, and so every state who has put in an application has their own program. And the SSBCI has several tools that they can use, and one of which, or that each state um, as part of their plan can use, um, one of which is a loan participation program where it's actually basically a, a vehicle for smaller CDFIs or CDFIs, not just smaller CDFIs, but CDFIs writ large to kind of get first loss capital or sell kind of 80% of the loans off their balance sheet. Um, now it's up to the states and other entities within the capital markets or elsewhere, um, intermediaries, with, intermediaries within the sector to kind of come up with ways to kind of invite in smaller CDFIs to participate in kind of structures like that. Um, you know, we've seen kind of CDFIs do um, participate out their loans with each other on, on a one-to-one -one basis, um, but again, that's not kind of a capital markets um, avenue. So I think, you know, first and foremost, um, you know, getting CDFIs rated, the larger ones, has helped move uh, the needle in terms of getting them more prominent within the, within the capital markets, but then also leveraging those ratings to allow smaller CDFIs who aren't eligible for a rating due to their size or just balance sheet or it's just not worth it because they're not going to directly access the capital markets, a way to kind of have them, the bigger CDFIs, to kind of lend that credit rating in some way, shape, or form. Um, you know, whether it be, you know, in a securitization structure, having a master servicer who kind of works in cooperation with smaller originating CDFIs. I mean, there's a lot of ways to think about it. Um, of course, 
you know, capital markets acceptance and institutional investor acceptance um, is, you know, it's, it's not easy at this point because it is a nascent sector and it's growing. I'm not overselling that this is easy to, to accomplish, but I think, you know, watching it long term, there, long term, there's a fair bit of tailwinds as it relates to federal capital, capital. and I just mentioned the SSPCI. But, you know, the elephant in the room is the IRA and the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund, which is $27 billion, $14 billion of which is, um, the, is targeted towards kind of two to three hub nonprofit or um, kind of maybe a green bank or something like that um, who will get those funds. Um, and, you know, applications were just due a couple weeks ago on that. And so, you know, that for the Justice 40 element of that, um, program provides that 40% of those funds need to go to underserved communities. Again, CDFIs do have, do are the, make the most sense in terms of being the channel for those funds to target the communities that they operate in. Um, and it hasn't been said yet, but um, you know, CDFIs, it's kind of shocking when you look at the loan performance history. Now, I'm, I'm speaking to mostly the rated um, section, a contingent of the CDFIs, but loan performance is actually quite strong, especially if you look at other kind of financial institutions. Their loan losses are, you know, relatively low, and the, you know, the, mag the secret sauce, so they say, uh, for CDFIs is that they know their communities, they know their borrowers, um, you know, they're able to kind of hold the, the right amount of loan loss reserves to offset the perceived risk. And, you know, that being said, on the equity side, as Jonathan mentioned, you know, they've had strong equity uh, ratios in part because of their strong loan performance in addition to all of the public and private capital that has kind of flowed into the sector post-pandemic. So I think I answered your question, but... <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I mean, just looking forward to the future, we talked about nascent asset class and looking forward. What are some potential challenges that would hinder the development of this market and, you know, some potential remedies that you would offer to these challenges? Um, Jonathan, oh, or, go ahead. John, you want to start? Or? Yeah. Uh, well, I didn't have a good answer. Um, <laughs> I can start. I can yeah, go for it. Because yeah. <laughs> I'm, I, I, I'm well versed in the naysayers. So, um, Basically, I think a big barrier to, to this is the lack of standardization. Investors in, in um, products, especially buying you know, securitized projects, products, want um, standard loans. Um, and you know, that's, that is an issue. Um, but you know, a way around that uh, could be a structure where you're kind of um, underwriting to securitize. So creating a product, um, a box at the onset that a CDFI can underwrite to that can then be packaged, seasoned, and sold. Um, I feel like that um, is a, you know, it's one tool and, you know, a big complaint amongst the CDFI community is that, you know, they are creating products that are tailored to their communities, um, which is so important. Um, but this could be one product on the shelf for them that could serve their communities and then could be marketable um, in a securitization. Um, so that's a big barrier. You know, I mentioned the market is obviously a big barrier. Um, you know, investors will pick their heads up for a good story, and but you know, they're a lot more discerning and a lot more protective of capital. Um, and so, and especially, you know, the, the politicization of the ESG market, and you know, all of these kind of you know, the noise around it. You know, investors, at least in the institutional ESG space, are you know thoughtful about what they commit capital to, which I think in this case, you know, CDFIs are a very easy sell in terms of it being a social or sustainable or green investment, um, you know, easier sell than others. Um, so I think that that's kind of a mitigant to all of this, but I guess. Yeah, uh, you know, I think when, when we've talked about it and we've talked about it, in, you know, really in terms of three issues, data, mm -hmm. volume, and standardization. And at various times in my career, I've been in touch with CDFIs and work with CDFIs and, you know, this kind of push and pull, Kristen, you described between wanting to make those kind of loans that are responsive to the types of borrowers that CDFI serve, right, those bespoke um, sort of types of collateral or uh, underwriting terms, um, but also wanting to do things at the scale that uh, would lead to some kind of capital markets activity. That that that's kind of the challenge I think that that you're describing, and I think that that um, you know that kind of speaks to how do, how do you get to that standard set of underwriting terms that would lead to some kind of securitization? How do you get data around that? What does that data look like? How does the market kind of understand that data? And then how does that volume kind of grow and um, lead to f sort of further interest within the industry? 
Yeah, and I guess I would pick up on something Kristen was saying earlier, which is that I do, I do believe in the secret sauce of CDFIs, that their connection to the community, uh, their knowledge of the borrowers is really important to that historical uh, strong performance uh, in terms of lending. And so, you know, we've seen this, I know when the Sorensen team has been examining the securitization issue, it comes up, how do you maintain the relationship between the borrower and the CDFI? Uh, is there a participation, a servicing agreement, something like that? It came up when we were looking at some of the pandemic facilities that the Federal Reserve set up that was trying to uh, buy, buy on loans and could you maintain the servicing relationship between that CDFI, who again knows that borrower and can understand, you know, how to work through, you know, extraordinary times like the the pandemic, the lockdown, and things like that. And I think that looks a little different than typical securitizations where it is, or or just selling of loans at where, you know, you, you borrowed your mortgage from one bank and all of a sudden Wells Fargo is your servicer mm -hmm. and you don't have much say in it. And I think it needs to look a little bit different for the types of borrowers that CDFIs are working with. Great, and so none of us are investment advisors here, but to the, in, to the institutional investors in the audience, how would you advise them to you know, potentially consider this asset class to invest in, and what type of institutional investors or impact investors are most suitable to invest in this? Whoever wants to take it. Well, I can talk about the credit strengths, as I kind of alluded to. Um, you know, I, I'm, I've been surprised at how well the CDFI sector has performed, especially in the broader backdrop of, you know, regional bank uh, stress. Um, you know, CDFI loan demand is quite high from what I, you know, um, hear from, from clients. Um, and the challenge is just figuring out how to meet that, that demand while still preserving kind of strong equity positions and, and not over-borrowing um, and maintaining, you know, profitability as it relates to kind of this escalating rate environment, adjusting their own um, rates while not to be punitive on their on their communities, but also to make sure that they're, you know, profitable enough. So, you know, I, I admire kind of the CDFI's ability and the creativity that they have among their finance staff in terms of collecting a variety of resources to kind of make the math work um, as it relates to their loan portfolios, um, and also while being responsive to their communities. Um, I mentioned before that, you know, that there were several CDFIs, or there are several CDFIs that have borrowed on an unsecured corporate basis. Um, in the capital markets, and you know they they were for you know right or wrong the SMP's response to them getting ratings and then going into the market and borrowing with rating downgrades, which you know is kind of counterintuitive because that was the intent of getting the rating, but that was the response. And so I think that you know once you get a rating and you're kind of in that sphere, you have to manage to it a little bit, and so that you know that does kind of alter behavior a little bit um, with respect to kind of having your investors um, in mind. Um, and so, you know, I think that, you know, the, the sector, you know, is, I think it's not for everyone in the sense that you do need to um, dig into kind of the loan portfolio, um, you know, the underwriting standards, the management team, um, you know, what kind of, what's their capitalization um, and kind of, you know, just the embedded kind of risks within the markets they serve. And this is, you know, kind of your standard credit analysis. But, you know, CDFIs, is, it's a broad market, a lot of sizes and shapes. And, and also that goes with some vulnerabilities in terms of, you know, being an investment choice. Um, so. Hopefully that Great. answers your question. Yeah. And... I mean, in addition to actually investing in their portfolios, what are the roles can investors play to support CDFIs and to help this nascent market mature and become real institutionally investable? I mean, I think I touched on some of this earlier, but again, um, to the extent that you're able to support uh, through technical assistance and capacity building in these institutions, especially um, newer CDFIs, those serving uh, you know, more uh, sort of historically underserved communities, rural communities, um, or the like. Uh, I think that's a really important role, mm -hmm. uh, especially for the impact investing community to play. And again, that can be, you know, through grant capital or it can be through the, the patient capital. So if you have the ability um, to, you know, uh, uh, go deeper down the capital stack, that's always going to be helpful and that builds it up. You know, this 
growth in the equity of the CDFI field writ large is really a tremendous uh, development uh, in recent years, fueled both by public policy and the, the interest of corporate and impact investors in recent years. So, you know, that has really given, I think, more buffer than the industry has had in a while. You know, since its inception, um, which will also help to mitigate some of the risks that Kristen's speaking to. Yeah. Um, earlier this year, I, I mentioned this uh, paper that we wrote about um, affordable housing, um, which was interesting. You know, to be able to survey uh, investment managers of um, private capital um, investment vehicles that are investing in uh, affordable, you know, U.S. multifamily affordable, be it NOAA or um, expiring uh, tax credit properties at the end of their uh, ex extended use or compliance period, anybody who is familiar with the low-income housing tax credit program or project-based Section 8. And so we asked these investment managers about um, the affordability targeting for the properties that they invest in. And we asked them how much capital that they've raised in the last X number of years, how much they plan to raise. Um, and we also asked them about their uh, LP mix, their investor mix, uh, on a percentage basis, what uh, what did their investor base? What does their investor base look like um, by investor type? Uh, in, institutional, um, uh, insurance company, bank, um, you know, impact investors, what have you. And what was interesting was uh, two thirds of the capital uh, that was committed to the respondents to our survey. And again, it's not a uh, state of the market. It's just these were the folks who responded to the survey. This was the case study. This is what we found. Um, but two thirds of the capital was from uh, non-bank investors, and a third of the equity was from banks. And what was uh, conclusive for us was this is really uh, that was really an example of where this sort of confluence of impact investors and bank investors who, you know, may or may not have the same motivations, but they're clearly looking at the same uh, assets and the same. Um, you know, types of, uh, of underlying investments. And that, that's interesting, and it's not too dissimilar from the conversation we're having here. Um, it's sort of, you know, at least somewhat analogous to sort of thinking about the types of products and the underlying loans and what would be needed to kind of bring this same confluence about. So I just point that out. Great. And just to kind of close on this, let's look 10 years into the future. Where do you think, A, where do you think we'll be? in terms of the securitization market? And then B, what do you think would be a metric of success? Like, how would you define that this is going in the right direction? Maybe we'll start with you, John, and go down the line. Sure, um, and I'll maybe flip it, because I think an important way to succeed in getting to uh, a really robust securitization market would be to continue to lean on the federal public policy levers. And so there's legislation that's been introduced in the Senate uh, by Senator Warner and Senator Crapo, uh, so bipartisan legislation, which would activate a part of that 1994 Rigel Act that's never been tapped before, that would allow the CDFI fund to uh, put funds into CDFIs or non-CDFIs that are providing credit enhancement, liquidity enhancement, or securitization products to uh, CDFIs. Mm -hmm. And so that would be a way to sort of like try to get the flywheel going uh, on this market or to at least test out if this is viable, if this is something that CDFIs want to participate in and if it has the impacts that uh, we think it would in terms of increasing the liquidity, increasing the scale of the market. And I think if uh, we were able to get that through and then uh, it was successful, you know, we would see access to the capital markets for a, a wider swath of the CDFI market still wouldn't be for everyone, um, but we'd be beyond the largest state. We'd be, you know, deeper into the market, and that would be really exciting. It would open up, again, the capital markets to more regional CDFIs, CDFIs in, in different markets, and, and could be a really promising sort of growth mechanism, so. Absolutely, great. Yeah, I think you, you raised a lot of good points. I think um, from kind of my perspective, I think, you know, with all of the strong support from the federal government with respect to the SSBCI, the IRA. Um, you know, I think that we're going to continue to see kind of the CDFI market grow um, and more CDFIs get rated. Um, with respect to a securitization structure, you know, I think there are a lot of, you know, 10 years is a long time, so that's a good window of time. I mean, it's going to be a, a dicey market maybe for a little while mm -hmm. with respect to elevated rates, which might hinder, you know, new structures to make um, economic sense um, for, for the, you know, near term. But 
you know, in 10 years, you know, I, I would like to envision, you know, hopefully some securitization of CDFI loans, um, non-standard um, kind of, you know, like not the ones we've already kind of discussed that have already been executed, something new um, mm -hmm. that it kind of leverages a lot of the federal subsidy and support that's kind of floating around out there. But I think ultimately the goal of all of this is to kind of see impact on the, on the local level um, in underserved communities. And I think, you know, we talk a lot about vehicles and financing structures and tools, but ultimately it's about impact. It's about seeing communities thrive whether it be mm -hmm. affordable housing or small businesses. And, you know, the tragedy would be everyone kind of, you know, there's, don't see the forest from the trees in the sense of, you know, actually making this trickle down and measure kind of the impact that these funds, whether governmental subsidies or whatever, um, what kind of impact they've actually had, the, you know, and that it's met its purpose. Yeah, I'll just kind of piggyback on, on um, what these guys both said. I mean, I think, um, yeah, I was on a panel earlier this year um, talking about the community development ecosystem um, and all of the different um, entities and actors, be they affordable housing or CDFIs or what have you, that are sort of active in low-income communities, providing financing in low-income com income communities. And <coughs> what's, what's interesting about, about that is um, just sort of thinking about the growth of the CDFI space um, but also the folks who are attending a conference like this mm -hmm. and, you know, whatever those numbers look like in terms of attendees five years ago and the number of people who are in the impact space who are asking questions about CDFIs then versus now. And so you kind of see the, you know, rise in the CDFI space, but also that there is a conversation happening about that world here in a conference like this. So I don't have a good answer for what <laughs> the 10 years from now looks like, yeah. um, but I, I do think that, you know, to the extent that there is some network building to be done. I mean, that seems like those things are happening sort of correlatively, right? That the CDFI industry is growing, the impact investor industry is growing. Absolutely. I think, you know, as you guys said, this is a growing industry. When I was doing some research, I saw 1,300 uh, CDFIs speaking to you earlier today. I saw that that's increased to 1,500. So this is something that's growing. And, you know, when we talked a lot about securitization and all these things, and we always have to frame it and as to what's the ultimate objective. This is to create liquidity for these CDFIs so that they can continue to you know, loan out to more small businesses, more affordable housing, and that's really where the impact is. So one question we have, we talked a lot about affordable housing and uh, small business loans, but we have one question from what kinds of community development pro programs or projects would you like to see CDFI support? So I'm guessing this is beyond the traditional uh, avenues. Hmm. I mean, you spoke to the Greenhouse Gas yeah. Reduction Fund earlier, and that's going to open up a lot of opportunities for CDFIs to, not that they haven't already done community facility work, but to do more on clean energy retrofit um, uh, and the other goals of the IRA implementation. Yeah. So that was the first one that comes to mind for me. Yeah, yeah. I think we're going to be seeing a lot more of that. I mean, we have a huge decarbonization agenda in this nation, and you know, CDFIs are kind of going to be offering products that are kind of geared towards that. Um, I mean, you know, what's, as we kind of keep reiterating, like CDFIs kind of tailor their programs to their communities. So, you know, if this, it's a charter school, it, you know, a com community is a charter school, um, you know, they're going to gear their loans towards providing charter schools in underserved communities. You know, I think, you know, a lot of the agenda kind of emerges out of the need. Um, and so, you know, I, I kind of like that aspect of, you know, how kind of CDFIs plan from a strategic standpoint. Um, it is very real and they're kind of trying to solve for what's missing in the community. And then we have another one that this seems to be kind of adjacent to CDS, CDFIs. Could you speak to neighborhood owned or kind of community development projects? Are you seeing growth in that space? I mean, we have certainly at the Alliance looked at the uh, emergence of more participatory investment models, um, as well as uh, some interesting crowdfunding programs that uh, present the opportunity for you know, residents, workers in place to be able to invest in these projects, and that's certainly very exciting. I think those are still small and uh, especially oftentimes sort of designed to remain sub-scale or small scale because 
you're trying to target a neighborhood, right? You don't want to uh, sort of go nationwide with that. You might want to replicate it, um, but it does make it a sort of different um, question for, for how you would sort of grow that type of investment uh, activity and those opportunities for, for uh, stakeholders to take part. I can't think of too many examples uh, off the top of my head, but one that comes to mind is um, we hosted this conference on affordable housing in, in March uh, in our building, and um, one of the panelists, uh, as I recall, mentioned a project in Philadelphia um, that had you know X number of sources of funds, but one of them was uh, community-sourced equity. Um, I don't remember the neighborhood in Philadelphia, but um, it, there, there are examples of this uh, where, where it is happening, um, and there are players who are kind of um, developing these nuanced models for how to do it and how to do it at you know some scale. So we have a really interesting qu um, question here for something I haven't heard before: CDFI deserts. So, it seems that there are certain pockets where there aren't any CDFIs, um, and you know, I guess this is more from a policy angle. How would you suggest to address these CDFI deserts or to promote the development? of CDFIs in areas that don't have them. Yeah. And I think it's a long-standing priority of the CDFI fund to try to address that. It's certainly true. There are mm -hmm. uh, many communities uh, that still don't have access to uh, many or any CDFI sort of institutions that, that are serving them. Uh, I think there's, maybe you know the answer, one or two native CDFIs certified. It's not many. I don't know the um, number. Last I looked, and so uh, in in uh, indigenous communities, there's a need to grow that, and so I think there's definitely a need for ongoing sort of targeted investment and building those up. And, and those are going to be, you know, your nascent institutions that really need that early uh, catalytic capital, be it from the government or uh, private investors, uh, to make sure they can get established and really grow a, a lending base. Um, to, to serve those communities well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and also, um, you know, sometimes not o not always the efficient answer is to start a new yeah. CDFI. Maybe mm -hmm. the, the efficient answer is to get a bigger CDFI to kind of come in. Um, they have some more economies of scale with respect to, um, you know, their infrastructure and whatnot um, and partner with others. And, you know, from what I've gathered from my covering the CDFI, sector, there's a fair share of cooperation among CDFIs with respect to this. And I mentioned loan participations, but it doesn't um, end there. There's, you know, a network of, well, I've seen it from the affordable housing side of things with respect to nonprofit affordable housing developers and CDFIs working in tandem, um, as well as kind of the network of CDFIs kind of coming in, you know, co um, co-lending on a project or something. Um, so, you know, there are opportunities for kind of the bigger, more established CDFIs to kind of help um, kind of fill in some gaps. Great. I mean, the other thing that you know we've seen is uh, examples where it wasn't necessarily a new organization, newly started organization, right? Mm -hmm. To yeah. Kristen's point about an existing organization moving into a new market, it could be a organization that's already working somewhere that just seeks the CDFI certification. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you know, those are examples. So great point. Certification, expansion, indigenous, a lot of solutions. Um, kind of more on, along those lines, rural, rural America appears to go to regional banks for small business loans. Why not CDFIs? Is, there, is this an issue of marketing or kind of accessibility? <laughs> I mean, I think that does come to the historical coverage of CDFIs. And as I was saying, rural uh, areas have traditionally had less coverage uh, from certified CDFIs. Uh, but again, to Jonathan's point, we're seeing you know, some established institutions seek the certification. And so there's a way to blend the two uh, answers. Building coalitions, aligning with, you know, group, you're bigger by the numbers, right, in terms of building a coalition and trying to get federal subsidies and, and whatnot um, to try to bridge that gap is, is essential. Um, you know, trying to figure out how to layer in private capital on top of that is kind of the, the goal. Um, but, you know, it, it, you, as you well aware, are well aware, it's, it's, it's a, it's a t it takes time, uh, I think, probably for all that to get accomplished. But I'm, I'm optimistic, given all the resources that are out there, that hopefully that there's more, more that can kind of flow towards those who need it the most. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think one big 
piece is naming the problem and naming that it is a problem and it needs to be addressed and that uh, and it is well documented and you can look at the flows of major philanthropy it doesn't go to rural communities um, and certainly not to, to indigenous communities and at the scale that it's needed um, I think continuing to name the question but then also think about uh, sort of new pools of capital and so we've looked at opportunities to engage donor advised funds uh, as you know the fastest growing charitable asset class uh, in the country right now um, and a very flexible one if you're able to access the donor advisors which is an if um, but uh, donor there's been work done to have um, to allow donor advisors to uh, make deposits into CDFIs so you know, depository assets aren't as you know uh, strong as more equity assets, but it's still something. Um, but then they could also be, you know, making direct contributions to CDFIs. And so I think that's a really interesting market to continue to pursue, but it's going to require breaking through and, you know, reaching, um, you know, the folks who are sitting on that capital and understand, getting them to understand that there needs to be um, some disruption to the system because it's you know, leading to this disparate outcomes. And just one thing I want to point out, just because we're talking about Native American communities and CDFIs, is um, so each of the reserve banks has a community development function. There's 12 reserve banks within the Federal Reserve System. Um, and some of the reserve banks have their own sort of special focus. Um, in New York, we have a you know focus more on the sort of financing components of this stuff. But in, at the Minneapolis Fed, uh, and I know the uh, guy who runs the center, there's a, a center for um, it's a, you're nodding your head, you know what I'm talking about, right? So um, those folks really have a, an interest for, for both from a research and outreach standpoint on um, financing issues and, as they affect Native American communities. So I would encourage you to get in touch with them. I'm happy to make an introduction or what have you. Mm -hmm. And we got a question about mission drift. So, you know, we talked about accessing capital market and this push for securitization. Do you think there's potential for, if the CDFIs are trying to reach these, um, is there a potential for mission drift or for them to prioritize profit versus their you know, purpose-driven mission? And how would you mitigate that? I mean, I think there's always a risk of that. Um, and I think it's, you know, falls upon the management of the CDFI to kind of stick to what their mission is and their long-term strategy of serving their communities. Um, that doesn't mean that the securitization option is a bad option in the sense that it's one tool. Um, you can choose not to use the tool. Um, so I think, you know, there's always a risk of mission drift, and I think it, it, it takes the management team um, some fortitude to kind of stick to what their priorities are and not kind of get too distracted by noise that's not relevant to them and might not serve their community. Great. Um, so we have one where it's a question. It's new to me. So it's about property assessed clean energy. And this is, comes from John Kinney with the Clean Fund. Um, and he's asking, so this is a credit enhancement tool focused on energy efficiency for commercial real estate. So how would a company reach out to a CDFI to offer this product? I don't know if you would have... I guess maybe this goes to the kind of clean energy we talked about earlier before. Yeah, so I think that CPACE, right, is that uh, the what it's um, referred to as in the market, and we've kind of seen some um, financings that are secured by CPACE loans. Um, and my understanding of it is there is, you know, an assessment on a, a commercial property that is kind of used to finance the retrofits. Um, you know, if that's a product that is of interest, um, you know, I think I, I'm not sure how many CDFIs offer it or um, kind of who to contact, but it is kind of an, an established product, and there is somewhat of a kind of securitization or secondary market for those type of credits, or at least there's kind of an emerging one. I, I know of, of one issuance that just kind of recently happened in that regard, but. Um, and so I guess the question was, who do, they, who do you reach how, out to? How would a company reach out to a CDFI for this? I guess they would have to first find out if, if, the they, CDF, offer the if they offer this product. Yeah. yeah. No. So I think, you know, in part, the um, securitization vehicle um, is a way to recycle capital. So odds are, you know, you're going to sell your loans, 80% of your loans, um, and you still retain servicing fees and whatnot. 
Um, but you would, will take that capital and recycle it and make new loans. And so you'll make that interest spread off of those new loans, ostensibly. So hopefully, you know, if it's functioning properly and there's no shift in business model and, um, you know, the CDFI continues to, you know, incorporate it in, as part of its business model, um, it doesn't necessarily, I think, have to undermine profitability. That being said, like, you know, not everyone is going to incorporate it properly. Um, it, it is kind of a new tool, potentially. Um, so that's kind of how I, I think about, you know, how it can be utilized. And, and again, it's, I think of it as kind of one tool. Mm -hmm. Those recovery um, loan funds that you were referring to are, were a great kind of, um, kind of experiment with respect to um, setting up discrete. Now, for those of you that don't know, there were four of these funds set up throughout the country, um, and they brought together private and public capital. I'm thinking of the New York Forward Fund specifically because that's my state, but you know that brought in kind of philanthropic money as well as the state um, kind of had funded a reserve um, for that fund, um, and they were able to buy up loans from CDFIs, and so it helped kind of and th these were kind of non-standard loans, right? So it helped show that there is broad appetite um, across the different segments of the investment community to buy into this structure, and then also. You know, the, these loans or facilities, they weren't, you know, QCIP securitizations, but they had a lot of those flavors to it. There's loan, um, loan data associated with it that can help build markets with respect to kind of a future securitization. So I think that those were really important. And again, it's like, like I was saying before, you know, with the with a lot of the federal dollars coming for these various programs, it's a good incubator for new ideas to kind of kind of take hold and see where they go in terms of building broader um, kind of scalability. Well, one thing I would just add on quickly is you think about this being a new tool to add to the, to the quiver, to the toolbox for CDFIs. It prepares them for changing market conditions. So, you know, if you're a CDFI and you don't feel like you have new loans to make off that 80% to recycle that capital, then that's not going to look like an attractive tool at that time. But market conditions can change. Um, and so I think that was part of the inspiration of trying to think about this tool now and sort of have it in uh, as something that could be used if liquidity became a constraining factor for the CDFI market. You know, just in, in 2021, we were hearing with the influx of uh, ECIP money and corporate money and other factors. Some folks we talked to at the outset of uh, researching this said liquidity is not an issue for CDFI, so why are we talking about this? Well, it looks a little bit different now that rates are going up, now that you have the crisis with mid-sized banks, uh, with maybe some of those deposits looking a little less secure. Um, and so now, you know, just to illustrate, you know, market conditions can change quickly, and so we want CDFIs to be prepared with a range of options to be able to, to meet the needs of their community in the moment. Yeah, I, I think it's a really great question. I, I mean, I think, you know, if you think about the range of 1,500 institutions with a CDFI certification, some are going to have uh, more of a need than others and at various times, right? Some are uh, going to have some level of demand that they're not able to meet based on the capital that they hold and their lending requirements and, and limits. Um, and so for those, I mean, it may be uh, a, a situation where they think about that volume and the, their you know, ability or inability or uh, or how to meet those uh, needs of their borrowers um, and, and fund those loans, right? And there may be a cohort of CDFIs for which that's way more interesting, and they can kind of prove out that, you know, to this point, like that side of their business. Um, it sort of grows from there, and maybe there are examples where, um, you know, f folks within the industry have seen that, and then they kind of learn from that. Um, but I, I think this, this point about... Um, that um, you know, it's one of a number of tools that, that CDFIs can use as they think about uh, how, how to originate loans, how to serve the customers and the communities that they continue to work with. Um, it, it, it's just, I, I think my best answer is that it's, um, it just doesn't feel like it's for everyone at the same time. Um, it does, there are probably greater needs and greater uh, sort of levels of interest based, based on the CDFI's own you know, situation.